is Rudy Diwela, and he's going to be talking about mobile and green technology in Africa. Thank you. Good morning, Campuseros. Uh, uh, I have been invited to talk here on mobile and green tech opportunities in Africa, uh, a field that I have been uh, researching for the last three years. So uh, there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of innovation happening in Africa, sometimes low tech, uh, but especially with green tech and mobile, there's lots of opportunities. So I'm going to show you a bit of what is happening there. I also give you some extra 3D printing stuff that is happening already in Africa. Um, so, solar energy is probably one of the most uh, key drivers uh, for growth in, um, in Africa. So this, for example, is one of um, a plant in Ghana, uh, where they uh, basically provide 115 mil milliwatt for 100,000 homes. So these are installed more and more everywhere in all the countries. Africa is the second largest uh, mobile market in the world now after China. Still a lot of feature phones, but it's a fast-growing market. I'll give you some numbers later on. And mobile is basically changing everything. You know, in Africa, there's no, uh, many times there's no internet connection, there's no desktop connectivity, so all the connectivity is happening through mobile. So we're living in a world of change, where software, internet, ideas, connectivity, and mobile devices are basically uh, creating a lot of change globally, so as well in Africa, creating a lot of opportunities. So there's a new generation of entrepreneurs uh, that are connecting globally uh, with new ideas to basically solve uh, problems everywhere. So um, this generation, I call them the Y generation. Why? Because they're not mainly interested in making money, but they're mainly interested in also uh, changing uh, the world and solving local problems. So many of these projects are funded by uh, crowdfunded. Uh, in 2012, there was 2.7 billion already uh, raised uh, on uh, crowdfunding platforms. And that is growing uh, this year too. And especially also in Africa, there's more and more projects that are uh, funded. But most importantly, uh, there's a new generation of coders, yeah, of software developers that are actually changing the game uh, for many uh, things. So let's hear it from them. Being a software developer in Africa is quite a challenge, actually. Um, yeah. Sound, please. Um, this is Amadou Dafi from uh, Senegal. Spread it in other countries, uh, such as uh, inadequate hardware to code in, uh, power outages. Uh, lack, lack of uh, or very unstable internet connection, lack of job opportunities, uh, and so on and so forth. Beside all of these issues, though, um, there's been a boiling uh, amount of talent among the software developers in Africa. Uh, I'm thinking about Ebu Tabi, a uh, Cameroonian, a uh, creator of Shell Feed Me. I'm thinking about Enram Tawia, uh, creator of iWarrior. He's a game developer, mobile game developer. I'm thinking about Mohamed Ndoy from Senegal, creator of iSenegal. And uh, lastly, I'm thinking about Charles Kitika, creator of iCow from Kenya. Our whole focus is... So did you hear that correctly? Probably not. So the main issues are basically uh, coders there that have lots of, uh, well, no access to good hardware. There's uh, con not always connectivity. There's lots of power outlets. Yeah, so you just have to imagine that, you know, half of the day there's no power, half of the day there's no uh, energy yeah, to, to code. So uh, lots of young entrepreneurs, 50% of the you know, population in Africa is below 20. Yeah? So there's a whole new generation of young people actually starting to do new things. This is Calvin Doe. He started basically uh, assembling stuff together making radios and all that at the age of 11. He built his own radio station at the age of 16. And uh, he was invited at MIT as the youngest uh, innovator uh, to go on a couple of weeks there to study. He's now working on a, a windmill project uh, to actually feed uh, his community in uh, Sierra Leone, in Freetown. This is Marta Chumo, 19. So she has a very interesting story. She wanted to attend the hacker school in New York, and she was actually admitted 
and uh, but she couldn't afford the travel cost. So she started a project, a crowdfunding project, I think it was on um, well, one of the platforms, um, where she raised $5,000, which was a lot more actually than expected to cover her travel. So then unfortunately, she didn't get her visa, which is very common if you want to invite uh, people from Africa abroad, they often don't get uh, access to a visa. So uh, devastated, uh, most of the people would be totally devastated, but she actually uh, decided to uh, use the money and create it for, uh, to launch her own hacker school in Nairobi. So she started a new project on the crowdfunding platform and she raised another $15,000 to actually start the hacker school in Nairobi. So now she's actually started a new developer school in Nairobi. She's 19 years old. Uh, here are Roy uh, Ombati and Haris Niali, students from uh, University of Nairobi and the Fab Lab, which is a 3D printing lab. Uh, they came up with a project that actually solves uh, uh, the Jigger disease, which is a feet disease I will explain later in the video. Steve Mutinda is one of the coders, the original coder of uh, Ushahidi, which is uh, a transparency tool for elections yeah, that is used in, in, in elections and governmental in Kenya and is actually exported in 159 countries globally. So this is what we call reverse distribution. There's innovation happening in Africa that will not only solve local problems, but would also go uh, global. So Africa is not a country. So you know, this every day the stories in the press about Africa, which is great for the image on sich of, of Africa. But uh, you have to know there's 54 countries in Africa, right? And every country is very different. Uh, every country has its own culture, has its own innovation pace. So it's good to look uh, a bit more in detail on everything. Fact is that the, f uh, the, the coming five years, seven of the most, uh, the fastest growing economies come out of Africa. Yeah, so Mozambique, uh, Tanzania, Congo, Ghana, Zambia, Nigeria are some of them with an average growth rate of over 7% yearly growth rate. Uh, here's a map of um, mobile penetration, which you see, as you can see, North and South Africa are very well connected, have already over 100% mobile penetration. And then mostly mid-Sub-Saharan uh, has already on an average of 45, 50% or plus. Um, the mobile penetration rates are growing for up to 700 million connected people in 2016. There's now some uh, 450. Uh, a factor for innovation, to create innovation, you need to build healthy ecosystems. So all these ecosystems or all these different pieces are falling into place in Africa now. So 3G, there's now over 3G, uh, over 30 countries connected with 3G. Those were only 10. Uh, five years ago, so it grows at a rapid pace. So the network towers, which were mostly diesel, mostly diesel generated, uh, are now more and more transformed into solar and wind powered um, uh, driven installations. So operators and the industry are also doing lots of investments actually to connect more and more uh, every country. Smartphones sold are growing at a fast pace. Google is activating uh, devices as hell. Uh, um, Chinese device manufacturers like Huawei are also uh, very aggressive on the market. So uh, it is predicted that uh, it's over 50% of smartphone penetration in South Africa by 2017, followed by Nigeria, Kenya and Tanzania. So the smartphones, uh, Huawei launched uh, the Ideos phone in 2011, which was the most popular smartphone in Kenya. They sold over 350,000 devices, which is half of the smartphone market there. And then Samsung is also uh, very aggressive on the market, uh, creating a $15 billion uh, market there. And Nokia is also, well, no, now Microsoft Nokia, uh, is very active still in the feature phones, yeah, with its Asha phone series. Feature phones uh, last year for the first time are actually declining in sales. Oops, something is happening. Um, Happen here. Yeah, sorry, sorry about it. So feature phones are actually dropping and being replaced by smartphones globally and also in Africa. So they are totally in decline. Uh, mobile money, everybody heard about M-Pesa. 
uh, but most of the African sub-Saharan countries have mobile money uh, activated through uh, their mobile operators. So that, that creates a lot of opportunities, which I show later, to actually pay through the mobile phone. Um, more and more funds, uh, equity funds, private equity funds, or uh, investing in Africa or investing in young technology. Uh, lots of American VCs are actually doing that. Uh, Savannah Fund, which is uh, co-funded by uh, Eric Schmidt from Google, is investing heavily. 88 miles per hour, which is a Danish fund, uh, is active in Cape Town and Nairobi, and many others are actually uh, installing there. Uh, technology hubs, this is a picture from the Hive Collab uh, in uh, Kampala, Uganda. Uh, there's more and more of them all over the, the continent. There's now some 22 hubs already in all the major capitals. And they are connecting locally with each other and also globally with other peers. Uh, more and more conferences, international conferences are coming to the continent. Demo is one of them. There's lots of Mobile Monday events, App Circus, uh, Pilot, Pivot event in Kenya and all that. Uh, some ambitious projects in the major cities. Uh, this one is Kenzo City in Nairobi, uh, which is a huge investment where they want to gather all the software and technology companies in one new area. Very well connected. Similar projects exist in Lagos and Cape Town and Johannesburg and Accra in Ghana. And the industry is also actually starting to uh, go to Africa. IBM uh, launched a research lab in Nairobi. Samsung is active, is active there. Microsoft launched a huge project. Intel is active. Lenovo, Chinese hardware developer, is uh, starting to launch smartphones in Africa and so on. So green tech and mobile innovation. Uh, this is the continent, yeah, as it is at night. Yeah, so you have to imagine uh, it's dark. Yeah, so there's mainly no electricity or the electricity there is there is powered by kerosene lamps, which are very polluting, and old batteries. Yeah, so this is a reality here. Uh, most of the electronic gadgets in the house and the light are actually powered by car batteries. Yeah, car batteries that are taken in the day to the garage and actually are refueled by uh, cars. So a very polluting uh, solution. Uh, luckily, there's more and more entrepreneurs that come up with low tech and uh, green tech solutions. This is Nuru, Nuru lights that actually provide lights, small lights that are uh, powered by a mechanical engine, which is actually cycled to generate energy and they are recharged. Uh, I have a short video here from this local entrepreneur who makes money by recharging batteries. Entrepreneurs become energy providers. Their muscle power feeds a simple generator. 20 minutes of pedaling can recharge five batteries. That costs 10 cents a light, a fraction of the price of kerosene. With normal use, the batteries last a whole week. What could be more efficient? Martin Uwayezu earns money both by recharging batteries and by selling the lights. And he has plenty of customers. My business keeps growing and growing. Last year I sold 175 Neuro lights, and I think this year I can almost double that to 300. Right, so you see this is a local ecosystem where local people actually come up with local solutions. So this is another light that actually has photovoltaic uh, panels on the side and a rechargeable battery inside. So. It has LEDs, uh, the photovolcanic panels and rechargeable battery and removable light. And Gaza Design is a San Francisco based startup that is uh, installing solar panels in uh, rural areas in, in villages. So, and that permits to actually uh, feed uh, light and to power solar batteries, uh, mobile phones, as you can see here. So the interesting thing is that they um, actually uh, transfer the data. Yeah? So the, they compress the data and they send it over audio tones yeah? as a pay-as-you-go mechanism. So it's a new uh, low-tech innovation. Actually, they use as a payment mechanism to recharge the batteries and the lights. 
So here you can see that on average uh, with kerosene, it's a $2 every week that a family needs to spend on uh, energy. And with this solution, they basically uh, pay a 25 cents or $25 a year. So there's a lot of uh, energy saving, money saving, and it's also a better solution for the environment. Here's another one. Yeah, this, it's this called is Mkopa in house. Kenya. My name is uh, Alex Keitan. I work in Kabarnet town. I just as a farmer. Uh, the solar panel, I just uh, I've just put it on the roof. Then the wire, then it connects to the control, then to, 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 to the control box, which is inside the house. So now, when you want to check the credit, just press it here. Then it shows, it shows me this zero eight days to credit. I opted for installment forty shillings every day. Because when I can, when I when I get some small amount, I can deposit 100 shillings, 200, 300, depending on uh, what I get do, do over the week or, uh, or or even the the, the month. I can even pay a thousand. Yeah, so I I find it easy. Then the kitchen, the light is here. That's actually changed my my life because uh, since I I bought it, I. I, I started using it to light the three rooms and even charging. Yeah, and even my, my neighbors benefit for charging their, 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 their phones. And then the balance is here. MCOP has received your payment. Kenya shillings, 150 paid to account. My account now. I find it very easy because uh, wherever I am, not only in town, but wherever I am, I can deposit some amount to Hembesa and then transfer it to MCOPA. So as you can see, you know, these are very uh, realistic scenarios in rural areas and villages, yeah, for farmers. Uh, operators have already jumped on the bandwagon. Uh, these are solutions by uh, Phoenix International, provided by, by them, also San Francisco-based startup for Vodacom and N MTN. Here's another one, Buffalo Grid, which is a London-based research project, which they do in Zambia, Tanzania, and Rwanda, I guess. Uh, basically, they charge phones, but they also they do it through bicycles. Yeah? So their local entrepreneurs are actually, actually cycling from village to village to uh, go and charge the phones for the villagers. So you can see it here, or then they go in the, you know, to the s uh, shortest or the smallest city where they can also recharge their phones at certain points. Talking ag about bikes, anybody heard about bamboo-based bikes? Yeah, so we have campuseros, but we also have bamboo-seros now. Yeah, so these are actually bamboo bikes that are made in Ghana and uh, Zambia. It's actually um, it's a frame designer from Greg Lemont who came up with the idea and who actually went over there to train people and started workshops uh, to provide these bikes. They have them in all flavors and sorts. They have race bikes, they have mountain bikes, they have even uh, dual sits or tandems. So some health projects. Um, uh, the two students, Roy, Roy and Betty and Harris Niali of the University of Nairobi, they uh, actually came up with a, um, a solution, 3D printed solutions for the Jigger disease. The Jigger disease is a um, is basically a little insect that um, attacks the feet. So the people that are attacked by that can't actually wear shoes. So they have to have customized uh, solutions. So here's a short video. Yeah, I kept the image short because it's not nice to see, so. There's no sound on this one. So you can see with this type of solutions that uh, 3D printing can solve and can help a lot of people also with customized solutions.
Yeah, here you see the solutions they have. So in many of the labs in the, the biggest uh, urban areas, there are already labs with 3D printers in Africa. Another very interesting one is a Gene Radar. This is from a, a Chicago-based uh, startup called NanoBioSim. So they actually uh, developed a device, as you can see, that actually can trigger with some saliva or blood uh, that can trigger HIV in one hour. So their uh, mission is basically to uh, make that available for one dollar a piece. Yeah, so this whole area is now controlled by pharmaceutics, but they try to disrupt it and make that more democ uh, the democratic pro process. Another one, this is in the labs in Zurich. This is 1.4 centimeter. It's a, a, a device that can be injected under the skin by a needle uh, that can communicate through radio waves and Bluetooth uh, with a mobile phone. So they can also transmit five different types of uh, blood results uh, to that device. So uh, that will be very good for cholesterol or uh, diabetes type of patients. Here you can see it on the finger. Another great one is the Water for Life project, which is basically a tube uh, that you can, can be used for any uh, dirty water. So there's, uh, I think there's daily still like 6,500 people dying from waterborne diseases. So this can be avoided. Uh, this device is $10, cost $10, and can provide drinking water for uh, one year per person. Uh, Faso soap is a, an invention, low-tech invention. It's basically a soap with uh, natural ingredients that uh, prevents uh, malaria. The most dangerous animal in the world is not the shark, the lion, or the crocodile. The most dangerous animal in the world is the mosquito. It is responsible for 300 million cases of malaria each year, 90% of which occur in sub-Saharan Africa, where it is the leading cause of death. Although malaria is avoidable through mosquito control and prevention of bites, a majority of Africans do not have access to repellents, which are expensive, toxic, or limited in their use. Fasop, made locally in Burkina Faso from natural ingredients, attacks malaria at its source by acting as a repellent against mosquitoes. So very low-tech solutions, you know, that can help millions of uh, people. Here's another one, Embrace. Uh, this, you know, every year there's 20 million children dying, premature babies dying, 20 million a year. So uh, this is due to temporary changes and all that. So... Um, um, here, uh, with, with this solution, this embrace, they can actually prevent that because this keeps the temperature the whole day, six to eight hours. So they save a lot of base babies uh, with that. Here's another low-tech device. This is a Petaton device. It's actually there to dry fruits. So uh, it's called the Jotpot. It's from Jola Ventures. And so how it works is basically it has this solar... Um, uh, plastic and then it goes uh, it creates a wind tunnel and the fruits are actually here so dried fruits uh, can uh, you know preserve actually food for uh, many people because most of the fruits are rotten after a couple of days in the heat so these are low-tech solutions that are very applicable and easy applicable and low cost education world reader most of them heard of of them already i guess uh, they are a San Francisco and Barcelona based non-profit that are actually distributing Kindle devices in Africa. So they uh, work directly with schools, Ministry of Education, and they, they provide Kindles to an entire school, 400 or 800 Kindles uh, to entire schools in Ghana, Nigeria, Uganda, Kenya and Tanzania. So the interesting thing is that they, crea they create business models uh, already for local people who are writing uh, stories or local students that are writing stories and can also sell them then through the network of devices. They're also available on mobile. They have some 500,000 readers uh, every month uh, on mobile devices. Here's a short video. We live in a world that changes rapidly every day. Yet in Africa, most children who attend school never own a single book of their own. More than half of sixth graders in sub-Saharan Africa have no books in their classroom. World Reader is doing something that's never been done before. We're bringing books to all in the developing world using e-readers. Technology, which is quickly dropping in price, has long battery life, 
and uses cell phone technology available even in the most remote parts of the world. We're able to deliver books with no printing cost and no shipping cost. E-readers hold thousands of books, allowing people to choose the book they want to read. Now students can hold an entire library in their hands and can read everything from the Magic Treehouse series to local stories like Anansi's Magic Drum, giving them and their families and communities access to the world and inspiring them to become whatever they want to be. They will be the change in their world. I want to be a lawyer. Yes, I want to be a mechanic. I want to be a doctor. <laughs> world Reader is proving this can work. We see it in the 500 students and teachers in the iRead pilot in Ghana. So you'll be using this alongside what you do in the classroom. <laughs> this element were provided by nature. Are you there? Yes, sir. They now have 35,000 books and access to millions more and we'll see it in the millions of people still to go. Yeah, I just love this project. Well, why? Because we don't, that, we don't have that over here, right? So uh, I think this can really be a game changer. So they have been operating the last two years already, so now Microsoft is copying the model uh, with a Mawingu uh, project where they also distribute tablets. The interesting thing is that they actually come up with a new technology uh, to create wide space broadband. So they can actually uh, uh, transfer data from one village to another over UHF antennas, which is low tech. So here you can see it. The community had never had real access to broadband at their schools. Their level of knowledge was really pretty impressive. Remember, these are kids who have never seen a computer before, and yet it took about 90 seconds for them to get to touch this thing. They got a sense of swiping the device and moving things around. You can learn all kinds of information about New York, where it is in the map. Let me see how very hardworking students. And given this opportunity, they are going to improve in their academic performance. They do not have the challenges they, they used to have because of the shortage of textbooks. Now they can get information from the internet. We've got the magic formula. And through this incredible new white space radio technology, using the old TV spectrum, we send our signals down the UHF for miles. Receive it on old-fashioned TV aerial and turn it into something unbelievably useful. Yeah, so these are all very interesting technologies that are applied uh, locally there. Google has a similar project in Johannesburg uh, in, uh, in South Africa. So this seems to be the way to go for Africa to connect basically rural villages and urban areas. Uh, some 3D painting stuff. Uh, this is the Philabot, which is actually it's a Kickstarter funded project where you can actually recycle plastic and uh, turn it into the mass that is used for 3D printing, the raisins that is used for 3D printing uh, recuperation. So this is this we have over here. But uh, does anybody know where you have uh, where all the desktop PCs, all our old printers are dumped? They are dumped in Ghana and Togo in Africa. Yes, yeah, so they're on huge dumps. Basically, all our Western junk from PCs and laptops and printers are dumped there. So the great thing is that local entrepreneurs are actually you know, recycling the bits and create new machines with it. So um, the Wu Lab, which is a group of students there, actually had a project of creating a 3D printer from all those old parts based on a, a Mendel 3D printer they have seen in the lab. So here's the first 3D printer in the making that's actually made in Africa. So you can see it here, which is called Wafate. Uh, they also participated in the Space App Challenge from the NASA, and actually they came up with an idea to uh, why not uh, send all that waste into space, to Mars, instead of Africa. Right, so and then so 3D printers can start uh, rebuilding other machines. So there's a short video here too. We're fat on Mars. Computer trash, a big problem. A lot of them finish their life in Africa, Togo or Ghana. Then a man's got an idea. He will transform old PCs 
into a 3D printer. He will call it the Wafat 3D printer. Then, at the International Space App Challenge, two Fab Lab met, Bola from Togo and Fab Lab from France. Together, they've got another ID. All this computer trash will be put in container, and all of this container will be put into a rocket. With five Wafat equipped with robotic arm and caterpillar, with solar panel and aeolian. So, Wafat on Mars. Yeah, so you see there's lots of I I ideas, right? So it might be a crazy idea, but who knows one day it might happen. So another one that I wanted to show you is the Marcus Kaiser project, the solar center project, uh, where he actually uh, uses sand and solar energy to create uh, new objects uh, with a 3D printer. It's a bit slow, but it's a whole process. It's a whole natural process, right? So it's totally solar powered. There's no electricity involved. So then he uses the sand actually as the mass, yeah, which is normally the raisins that they use for uh, the source to create 3D printed objects. He uses the sand and the sun to do that. So with the lens, he just burns the sand. So it becomes a flexible mass that can turn, you know, he can mold it into different, uh, uh, different objects, as you see here. Here you see in a faster version how we're actually molding new objects.
pretty amazing, no? So these are the type of innovations that are, well, basically demo lab stage, but that can be used also on a bigger manufacturing scale. I think here is going to come up with a type of uh, ceramic type of pot. And off he goes, yeah. So um, I think despite the, the many challenges that Africa has, you know, in infrastructure, health, education, poor governments, uh, there's a lot of persever perseverance from uh, local uh, and the young generation that actually, that is, they are not waiting for us actually to change things, they are doing it themselves. They're all connected to the rest of the world through the internet and that uh, enables many things for them. So if you look at the numbers of Africa, the continent, you know, it includes China, Japan, United States, uh, Europe, Eastern Europe and India. Yeah, so the, ha the inhabitants uh, that are living there, so the, the next decade is going to be a lot of innovation coming from there. And green tech and mobile are definitely key drivers. Uh, I wanted to close off with uh, this project, which is called SunHop Solar Balloons which is a project by envir environmental architect Joseph Corey and aerospace engineer Dr. Pini Gulfi. And these are actually solar bulbs. It's a new technology that they have photovolcanic um, parts on the outside and on the inside they are filled with helium. Yeah, so these are new technologies that are actually, uh, I think a ball of three square meter is the same as a 25 square meter of like photovolcanic uh, solar power panels. So it's a, a nicer option and two of these balls can actually power an entire home. So these will also uh, uh, be coming to market very soon. Thank you. So yeah. I'm open for questions if you have any. You have my contact details here. Any questions? No? Come on. <laughs> I'm sure you have. Okay. Well then, thank you. And enjoy your day. Mm -hmm. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, at two o'clock on Leonardo's stage, we're going to have Nick Fain talking about social media in sport. He's the founder of one of the biggest sports websites in Europe, uh, GiveMeSport.com. Thank you.